Well, Professor King, it's nice to be with you here in the United States. As our audience is about to learn, the last two times I had the pleasure of being with you um, was in Dubai when we were both attending the uh, Middle East Northern African Governance Congress. You as a keynote speaker and me as a, the uh, chairman of the event. And if you recall in the last session, which was uh, 2008, right in the middle of this global economic meltdown that hopefully we're working out of, we all got the, uh, together and said, why don't we come up with what we think is a universal purpose of corporate governance that if the world applied would hopefully prevent these types of things from happening in the future. And really appreciate your input and uh, participation in that. In fact, you actually, if you recall, in a string of emails between you and myself after the event, actually fine-tuned that definition of uh, universal statement of corporate governance for us. And uh, I'll just state what that is. It's, we believe that the universal purpose of co corporate governance is integrating ethical, professional, and industry values and standards to create a firm level culture that enables winning strategies, minimized risk, meeting the needs and expectations of all the stakeholders while fulfilling um, our responsibility for a sustainable world. So would you like to comment on that a little, little bit? Well, first of all, um, I agree with it. And secondly, um, I think the foundation of all of that is what I've written about and spoken about all over the world is yes. intellectual honesty. Mm -hmm. That honest application of mind by the director for an incapacitated juristic person mm -hmm. because the company is incapacitated. Right. It has no heart, mind or soul of its own. Mm -hmm. The director becomes the heart, mind and soul of mm -hmm. this company, mm -hmm. which is very integral today to society yes. and linked millions of people linked. If you just take the case of Enron, right. which is the locus classicus. Right. Enron, when it collapsed, impacted on the lives of millions of people. Absolutely. Absolutely millions of people. But here was a, an incapacitated juristic person with Mr. Skilling and Mr. Lay mm -hmm. acting out of self-interest. Absolutely. Rather than intellectually, honestly applying their minds in the best interests of this incapacitated company and taking account of the interests and expectations of those stakeholders. Act. They virtually ignored them. Act, acting, acting as if they were an independent whole as opposed to part of an independent, much larger whole. Absolutely. There's, there's a linkage going right through right. society. And right. You can't ignore it. Absolutely. And, and you know, we talk about the goal of creating a global ecosystem, which is just that, when all the parts work interdependently in pursuit of those significant few enterprise-wide wide goals, which when achieved also ensures the success of the parts. And I think we're trying to move towards that. And one way to do that is if we can get every company to begin functioning as an ecosystem and then interact with its partners to become ecosystems, then just making an expanding scope of ecosystems, eventually we can actually move toward that goal of a global ecosystem. So it can actually become an opportunity to pursue as opposed to a pipe dream to dismiss, which some people do dismiss it as a pipe dream. I also um, enjoyed our conversation driving down here when you were educating me about the role of GRI and um, the, in the um, integrated reporting and how important that integrated reporting is. And I was struck with, with um, how similar your aspiration is for GRIs to that of, let's say, ISO 9000 with um, their quality standard. And to a large degree, that has become the quality standard. And of course, the mantra of quality is very simply, say what you do, do what you say. So in a way, I was, I was looking at your integrated reporting as the model for saying what you do, but that still leaves unaddressed then doing what you say. And I think the approach um, that I've been developing with Hank Borner at the GNI Institute of Strategic Governance is an opportunity to do what you say so that when you report through integrated meaning, you can say what you do and be doing it with the type of intellectual honesty that you mentioned. Because in both cases, both of our um, initiatives seem to focus on and put an emphasis on the ability to integrate um, governance with strategy, risk, culture, and social responsibility. And would you mind sharing um, with everyone and, and saying why that's so important? I think well, you actually say they need to become inseparable. Yes, I, I think governance, the way directors steer a company, because that's what they do, they direct it to reflective role. Mm -hmm. Managers manage, they implementing that which the directors direct mm -hmm. and steer the plan. The strategy, the long-term direction of a company, what it's going to do, um, and the sustainability issues relevant to that business as water is to the beverage manufacturer, mm -hmm. just as an, as an example, they are inseparable today. You yes. cannot ignore them. 
if you think of the world, and sometimes I describe it as an hotel, mm -hmm. I and mean, I call it Planet Inn, mm -hmm. the hotel, right. we live in the same hotel. Mm -hmm. We all expect mm -hmm. to be boarded and lodged. Right. But at the moment, there's food shortages, mm -hmm. there's lack of food security, mm -hmm. there's wars have started over water already. Right. And, and yet, by 2045, 2050, the expectation is from six and a half billion people, we're going to be nine and a half billion mm -hmm. people. Well, it's quite clear. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to appreciate that we've got to learn to make more with less. Mm -hmm. We've got to carry, we've got to conduct business as unusual. We can't carry on the same as right. before. And all this needs collaboration and an integration, the one thing impacts on the other. Right, exactly. Not sep they're not separated. And I summarize it in the following statement. I am mm -hmm. because you are. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happens with a company. Mm -hmm. The company is part of society. Yes. And it impacts on society. Society impacts on the company. The company impacts on the environment. Right. The environment impacts on the company. Right. And you need to holistically report well, that so that the stakeholders can make informed assessments about that company. Is it a responsible citizen? Why is it that you are able to assess that your neighbor in your apartment, you live in an apartment or your house, mm -hmm. is a responsible citizen? Right. You need to also have information to assess that a company, which is as integral to society today as the family unit, is acting as a responsible corporate citizen. Exactly. You need that information. Exactly. I mean, and that brings to mind all the companies that have been in the newspapers now, unfortunately, for years now, because Enron happened, I think, in two, what, 2001, 2002, that really didn't act responsibly. And of course, now in the headlines, Goldman Sachs, um, a premier um, Wall Street firm, is, is in the paper and is being um, charged by, S, by SEC with some very serious um, allegations. And to me, it also brings up the point, it seems like a key theme here is integration. And it seems to me that Goldman Sachs, again, based on the allegations, might be a case in point where they didn't integrate ethical, professional, and industry values and standards, but rather they might have considered ethical as something that's in addition to um, professional values and standards, and professional values and standards are in, in, in addition to industry values and standards. And to me, the, 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 the goal through, the, through integration is to make sure that the ethical values and standards is the threshold level of behavior. And then that gets integrated to, but then is raised in terms of raised expectation through professional values and standards. And then both those are integrated into industry values and standards. And therefore, you get to a point where industry values and standards are the highest level of performance. And they, they're at a higher level than the other two. And it enables ethical values and standards and specifically governmental um, legislation and regu regulations to serve as a safety net just in case things go wrong. You've given some examples, but uh, I don't know what all the facts are. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the expression of conduct there is important in the Goldman Sachs example. Right, Espe especially if you're defining conduct as behavior. Yes, because and, be uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. As you say, they're merely allegations. Right, exactly. Moment. And they're civil, they're not, they're not criminal. That's correct. And uh, the answer might well be that it was completely lawful to, to package uh, securities and at the same time to short them. Right. Which, as a lawyer, prima facie, it is mm -hmm. lawful. Mm -hmm. the, question, the question is whether that's acceptable conduct to society at large, exactly. and whether it's going to impact on the reputation of Goldman. Right. That, that's the critical issue. And one of the critical issues, one of the greatest assets today is a corporation's reputation. Mm -hmm. If you look at Coca-Cola, for example, Coca-Cola, uh, if you look at its market cap right. on the NYSE, you look at its book value, it's about 17% mm -hmm. of its market cap. Right. As we know, it's the greatest brand in the world today. But what's the other side of that coin? I agree. Is its conduct, its behavior, its mm -hmm. good citizenship. It's and it. that's why it's got this whole plan of saving water, is to show the world we're a responsible corporate citizen. You're exactly right. It brings up the distinction between being respected for the job you're in versus being respected for the job you're doing. 